He has this summation. This is a great mystery. That, and that nobody may be deceived by an ambiguity if he explains he's not speaking of the physical union of man and woman or the spiritual marriage of Christ and the church. So that's Calvin saying the same thing that Luther was saying. That's how salvation works. We're united to Christ as a work of the Spirit. Okay? So with that, he says love is basically part of marriage, and marriage is the workshop for what it is to love God. So again, this is the same tradition. The change of heart comes from the flowing out of God's love into our hearts, changing us and drawing us to love the Son as in marriage. He's the pursuer, we're the pursued and we respond. Okay. Um, let me also mention, by the way, that I have a book here. I was going to read a segment of it, but I'll let it go. Uh, one with Christ, uh, Marcus Peter Johnson. This was published last year, just to let you know. There are current books that are writing about this sort of thing. Uh, Marcus uh, Peter Johnson, an evangelical theology of salvation, says this whole thing of our union with Christ is the key to understanding how salvation works. He's a professor at a Bible school, what's it called? Uh, Moods, Moody, Moody. <laughs> Moody Bible Institute, okay, he's one of the profs there, and it's a fine <coughs> book, I really encourage you to read it, it's a great one, because he talks about the same things, reflecting the same tradition here, that the change comes from the inside out, as we become united to Christ, by his love for us, capturing us, drawing us, we become one, as his spirit unites with our spirit, and that's how salvation works. It's called the Theology of Participation. Um, now what I'm going to do is um, pick up a little bit of this debate again of uh, Aquinas because I think it's so much of, um, oh I'm sorry, I need the other one uh, if I could on uh, Augustine and Aristotle. I want to get to this eventually, but I'm not going to go there yet. Just, just, just while we're fiddling with that, let me um, read a little bit of Aquinas. We talked about Aquinas as a key turning point. And what is interesting about Thomas Aquinas is um, yeah, I guess we've looked at that already. Never mind. Forget that one. Um, we'll just leave it off for now. Uh, here's the question in his Sum of Theologies, blend of Aristotle with Christianity. He also blends uh, Dennis, Dionysius, because he is at, writing at the time when Dionysius was held to be a true apostle, disciple, I should say, of the Apostle Paul. So he's accepting that. So here he's writing... Here's his question. Does love exist in God? Well, guess what he believes about God? That God is the unmoved mover. And to be unmoved is not to have motions or emotions. Okay? So that's a key assumption. In fact, um, what we call this in really fancy terms is anthropopathism. When you talk about God so loved the world, that is taken by people who would hold what is going to be argued here as strictly uh, an act of God's will, not an act of, or a function of uh, affection, not a desire-based feature. In other words, God's love is without affection or it's disaffected. It's a disaffected love. I, Tease that by suggesting my supposed relationship with, who did I say, Gertrude? Who I don't really like, but who I love. See, that's disaffected love. That's the idea of, I don't like her, but I'm going to use the language of love. And by love, I mean I'm going to will certain things, such as her doing dishes and her cleaning the house and her, got a whole list of things that I have not talked about. And I'll pay some of the bills, and I'll do more the lawn, and I'll do the, you know, clean the garage, you know, to take out the trash. But it's that sort of thing where it's disaffected love. Okay? So here's the question then. Does God have love, even though the Bible is saturated for the loving kindness of God endures forever, and so on? Um, 
we proceed thus to the first article. It seems that love does not exist in God. Objection one. For in God there is no passions. Now love is a passion, therefore love is not in God. Because God cannot have passions. According to who? Um, objection two. There further, love, anger, sorrow, and the like are divided against one another. But sorrow and anger are not attributed to God unless by metaphor. A uh, figure of speech, an anthropopathism, a language attributing to God a human emotion, pathos, anthropopathism, man, passions, and to assign them to God when God cannot, cannot really feel them or have them. So that's he's saying, except by figure, by metaphor. Therefore, neither is love to be attributed to him. Objection number three. Further, Dionysius says, Love is a uniting and binding force. But this cannot take place in God since he is simple. Therefore, that is, he's not, he's not divided, he's not got pieces to him. Therefore, since uh, neither is love, sorry, therefore love does not exist in God. Then he writes, on the contrary, now this is the path he always uses. He uses argument, objection, objection, said contra in the Latin. On the other hand, However, the Bible says, God is love, 1 John 4.16. My answer, so here's his solution. We must assert that in God there is love. Okay, this is Aquinas speaking. And I've been emphasizing Augustine is the love-centered model of spirituality. And all of a sudden we discover, oh, we must assert that in God there is love, because love is the first movement of the will and of every appetitive power. That is, everything I do, I do by a desire. He talks about that as the appetitive will. So, everything that is done is a function of the will, and that's called love. For since the acts of the will and of every appetite of power tend towards good and evil as to their proper objects, and since good is essentially and especially the object of the will, and the appetite, while evil is only the object secondarily and indirectly as opposed to good, it follows that the acts of the will and appetite that look towards good must naturally be prior to those that look towards evil, Thus, for instance, joy is prior to sorrow, love to hate, because that exists of itself, uh, because what exists of itself is always prior to that which exists through another. Again, the more universal is nat naturally prior to what is less so. Hence, the intellect is the first ordered to universal truth, and in the second place to particular and special truths. Now there are certain acts of the will and appetite that regard good in some special condition as joy and delight, regard good present and possessed, whereas desire and hope regard not good as yet possessed. Love, however, regards good as in general, whether possessed or not. Hence, love is naturally the first act of the will and appetite. Does that make you want to keep on reading or what? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just telling you, you have to read this stuff and say, where did this tradition come from? And it comes from a massive process of rationalizing. And it starts with Aristotle's assumption that God is the unmoved mover. And with that, he has no emotions. So what you have to do is talk about God's love as an act of the will, not anything that has any desires or affections in it. Which makes sense for Aristotle, because for Aristotle, God is a singularity, a monad. And there is no one for him to love other than himself. In fact, it says in his metaphysics that God can only think about himself. Otherwise, anything that he thinks about other than himself, unless he thinks about the other thing in terms of himself, which he can do, he can think of all of us in those terms. In other words, to be self-absorbed would make him less than God. That is Aristotle's assumption. So that means God is self-absorbed in his fundamental ways, and he therefore can have no interest in others other than as it satisfies himself. 
Okay? That is Aristotle. Aquinas believes that. And so what he does is he said God is the unmoving mover. And so what happens, we can talk about love as something related to goodness and but it's an act of the will towards the good and not towards the evil. And he's setting up on a summary here where he can use the language of love without loving. And so that tends then to lead to a theology of progression in his system of theology of what we call faith formed by love. But by love, he means the act of the will to choose to, to do certain things. Now, what was it that Augustine said towards Pelagius, who believed that love is an act of the will? He said, that's insane. We love God because we respond to his love because he loved us first. So that's where the division really lies. So this would just be an illustration of how words can be the same words, but they can have different meanings. The idea of the act of the will version of love versus a heart-based um, responsiveness. And once we have the Trinity in view, guess what happens? We have love explained not by his love for us, but by his love within himself that overflows as a spreading goodness. And that love is not contingent or based on us, that God needs us. It's rather that he has love to spare and he sheds it abroad into our hearts and we respond to it. He wants a bride for his son, is the bottom line. And he wants the son to have his love capture the bride. Okay? So that's the Augustinian tradition of marriage. Um, now, what can we say about the key assumptions between these two, <coughs> classical theism and Augustinianism? First of all, there's a key assumption that we haven't talked about yet in classical theism. And Aquinas gets this from... Dionysius, and Dionysius believes that there is an absolute gap between God as creator and the creation. That creation and creator are altogether different realities. He says this is being, everything that's created is being, God is unbeing. And unbeing cannot mix with being. And you go, I don't get this, it doesn't make any more sense than a bunch of beings, you know, this is crazy, what's he talking about? Well, it's just that. It's just that he's saying, well, I'll just quote it. Shall I read a little bit about this? Yes. The pseudo Areopagite, the guy from 500 who claimed to have been the disciple of Paul. He's a liar. I'm biased against him already. What has actually to be said about the cause of everything is this. Since it is the cause of all beings, that is God, we should posit and ascribe to it, that is God, all the affirmations we can make in regard to beings, and more appropriately, we should negate all these affirmations since it surpasses all being. Now there's a context for this. He's saying, how are we going to talk about God? So he's saying, this is my setup. Now, we should not conclude that the negations are simply the opposites of the affirmations, but rather that because of all is considerably prior to this, beyond privations, beyond every denial, beyond every assertion we have God. This, is, this at least is what is said by Blessed Bar pa Bartholomew, who was one of the larger group of early church disciples. So he said, oh, remember Bartholomew. You can actually find in the Bible a guy named Bartholomew. We just don't have anything by him except some later books that are not considered scriptural, that are attributed to Bartholomew, like the Gospel of Thomas, the Nag Hammadi scrolls, and some of these things. We call them Gnostic writings. They're not, they're not orthodox. They're not reliable. Okay? That's a separate conversation. So he says that the word of God is vast and minuscule, that the gospel is wide-ranging yet restricted. To me, it seems that this, in this he's extraordinarily shrewd, for he has grasped that the good cause of all is both eloquent and taciturn. Indeed, here he's talking about God, wordless. In other words, God is ultimately wordless. It has neither word nor act of understanding, since it is on a plane above all this, and it is made manifest only to those who travel through foul and fair, who pass beyond the summit, he's picturing Moses climbing the summit, of every holy ascent, and who leave behind them every divine light, every voice, every word from heaven, and who plunge into the darkness 
where as scriptures pro proclaims, there dwells the one who is beyond all things. So where do we find God? In the darkness. What is God like? He is without words. He's unlike being because he's beyond being. So there's no mixture or combination or connection between God and <laughs> creation. Um, it is not for nothing that the blessed Moses is commanded to submit first to pur purification, then to depart from those who have not undergone purification. For when pur purification is complete, he bears many voice trumpets, and he sees many things, lights pure and rays coming down abundantly. Let me skip ahead. But then he, Moses, breaks free of them and away from what he sees and, and what is seen, and he plunges into the... Truly, I think I just lost my mic, did I? into the truly mysterious darkness of unknowing, here renouncing all that the mind may conceive, wrapped entirely in the intangible and the invisible, he belongs completely to him who is beyond everything. So where do you find God? Beyond everything that exists, and unlike everything that exists. Here, being neither oneself nor something else, one is supremely united to the completely unknown by an inactivity of all knowledge and knows nothing beyond the mind at all. In other words, the words to know God is to cease thinking and just look for pure experience. So that's the right wing. But what happens is this is being quoted when it talks about love by Aquinas. He says, well, blessed Dionysius says, so what he does is he says, you know, like Dionysius, there cannot be any contact between God and the creation. Now, is there any problem with that? That we could just think of instantly. <coughs> Who is fully God? And fully man. And fully one. Jesus Christ. And so there is no such thing as this absolute beyond. What did Philip say? Show me the Father. And what did Jesus say? When you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Okay? And the Holy Spirit is the one who's doing the communicating. Yeah. And so that's the process of the Trinity at work. And you can see that this guy is taken from the Platonic, Plato, Platonus, uh, whatever. But the point that Plotinus and uh, Porphyry, the point is that this Aquinas gets this too, and he believes that the God cannot in any way link up with man. Instead, grace is the infusion of power into humanity that allows us to sort of connect, but not really. By acts of will, acts of choice, a faith formed by love, that is, love enabled by the power of infused grace to work hard to try to reach and close the gap, gap that can never be closed. Okay, so that's the complex side of it. So that's a, a key assumption. So grace then is the what that bridges the gulf between God and the creation. Human duty then is to use this grace by forming the bridge. And love is an act of our will. It's our exercises of following God's commandments then that's labeled as love. Okay? Whereas for August, Augustine, Jesus is the bridge between God and the creation. And grace is the who of Christ coming to us, pouring his spirit out into our hearts, and drawing us into a relationship with the Father so we become partakers of divinity. We literally get to, through Christ, be united to Christ. Okay? And love is our response to God's love for us. So lots and lots of uh, really uh, thick stuff there. Now let's go on to my next chart that uh, I should have left up there. Let's go back to that uh, um, uh, the third, uh, uh, the, the Neoplatonic one. Now we want to go into the third wing, mysticism, and pseudo-Dionysius. Let's just... Uh, Start the slideshow here, and here we have Plotinus, here are his dates. 
and he's looking back to Plato. Now notice the difference, 205 is his birth date. Plato was born 427 BC, so what's that about? Over 600 years, isn't it? Difference. So we're not talking about people from the same period of time. This is an attempt to revive what Plato stood for. And Plato, remember, we talked about chairness. Cher Plato says every one of us has a insight and um, elimination of the ultimate ideal chair in God's mind. But God doesn't talk about chairs because he doesn't talk to anyone because God is one and one doesn't talk to something other than himself because one has no one to talk to. And that's what we saw as the assumption in Dionysius. He says God is beyond words. There's no, he's not like us. He's in darkness. And so what he will do is actually uh, separate that which can be known about God from that which cannot be known about uh, the non... You know what a discourse is? It's, a, it's someone making a conversation with someone else. That's what it means to be non-discursive, to not have conversation we have here on the, on the chart. So he is the non-knowable one. So... What happens is the one, according to Plotinus, has double emanation of mind and soul. Call it like solar flares, you know, go out and then fall back in. But in this case, it's a double emanation. Kawoosh, and then out of the whoosh comes a kawoosh, and, and then it all goes back into the one. And so the point that's being made here is there's space in this system. This, these guys are not Christians. There's no effort, no inclination towards Christianity here at all. They're not the least bit Christian. And what they're just trying to do is say, how is it that there's space for language to exist in the reality of the one creating what he created? Well, what we can say is that he could extend himself out into his creation without quite touching it but sort of like these flares of both mind and soul, but they are separate from the one when they're out from him, emanating from him, thus emanation. But then they come back into the one, and that's what we want to link up with according to this tradition. So, pseudo Dionysius, who comes along in roughly 500, that's the best guess, we don't know where he's from but he claims to be the disciple of Paul. He then goes ahead and adapts the ideas of Plotinus to the Bible and to the biblical God. So what he does is he says, ah, the one, that's the father. The mind is the son and the soul is the spirit. So here we have a trinity. So what he's done is he's Christianized the pagan philosopher Plotinus, who's drawing it from Plato. Does that change anything? Well, yes it does. What he does is he says, ah, so what we have to do is ascend into the one. I call it surfing, wake surfing, or real surfing, or whatever. It's just riding the spirit as he returns into the one and that's what you do as a, an act of spiritual pursuit. And it becomes an ascent. It's a climbing. And so those are stair steps. And the big bam, the buzz that we were looking at yesterday, or talking about yesterday, is what I have is I should have made it a red or some other color flash, but blue it is. That's the bang that you're looking for. So what do you do to get there? First of all, you purge yourself of all distractions. If God is not a talking God, then you don't do much with the talking side of God. And so what he does is he says, well, God has a lot of talky-talky stuff. And he talks about that. He has a term for that. And here's it's a fancy word. It's on your sheet. I've included a sheet here that's describing this whole thing. And I've got the ladder there. You'll see it. He has what he calls the cataphatic reality. That is, the self-disclosure of God through the teachings of the Scripture. He says, now that's the beginner stuff. So what is the Bible for him? Beginner stuff. What's the deep stuff? Put it aside and start looking for pure experience. So that means you start to purge yourself by doing something like the Jesus prayer, which we shared yesterday. Jesus Christ 
Son of God, have mercy on me, the sinner, whatever that prayer was. Just keep repeating it. Breathe it. Breathe it. Breathe it. Why? Because you're purging yourself from thinking. Then you try and get to illumination. You're waiting for the Spirit to give you the buzz of catching you up and running you into the one, and finally you try to achieve ecstatic union. I'm united with God. What is that like? I can't talk about it. It's beyond words. God doesn't speak. I don't speak. I just have pure experience. Now, that's pretty inviting to the current culture. Believe me, who are looking for pure experience. And so that's why I mentioned Amy uh, yesterday. Amy is the gal that got drawn right into this because she was looking to climb and get that pure experience. She had been trained in our Bible school that was largely... I'm not picking on the Roman Catholics when I'm talking about the scholastic tradition. That's the tradition of Multnomah School of the Bible as well. It's just the tradition of self-moved will and, you know, just lots of I determined to love God and lots of that stuff is duty-driven Christianity because it's mostly intellectual and not affected. It's, in fact, what I found is the more people climbed in the academic tradition that I was a part of, the less they loved God, because they learned that God isn't one who loves us, so why should we love Him? It's all about intellect, it's about will. And so they, that's why sometimes we'll see people go to theological training and their heart just goes cold, even though they went in hot as pistol. Okay, because the theology of the left tradition tends in that direction. Not everyone is there, I won't say that at all, but that's the tendency based on the assumption that God is different, God is distant, and love is an act of the will, not a response of the heart. So what happens then is that in this tradition, in his synthesis, his putting together Neoplatonism and Christian themes, Dionysius, give you some other names there, elevated direct experience of God over access to him by God's sharing himself in both the creation and the Bible. So Dionysius coins the term apophaticism, or the via negativa, or here's where we should have started, the negative way, to emphasize God's utterable unknowability. So we read a segment, God can't be known. I quoted from him, and that was what he believed. God is beyond us, so he is unknowable. To get close to God is to enter into the unknowable. I go, what a blessing that is. Uh, as one who doesn't hold that. And to emphasize God's utter unknowability is the key to the best, is the best, best pathway. He talked about what can be known about God is cataphaticism. True spirituality, then, is to enter into the cloud of the unknowing. That is to seek pure experience in order to encounter God. And the Spirit then seeks carriers into this unspeakable, ineffable uh, union with God. And it spread then to other spiritual leaders. And they believed that this was what Paul was teaching. They're just going, we have never gotten this before, but it must be what Paul taught without realizing that it was false. It was created in the 500s. And it was really from the Platonic tradition. And what happens then, it becomes what Dionysius uh, becomes the saint that Maximus, the confessor, uses to set up Greek Orthodoxy. So when I talked to Amy, I knew that when I spoke with her, I'd have to go back and show her this history and say, Amy, what you're hooked up with in your Greek Orthodox worship is actually Maximus, the confessor, drawing on Dionysius. And here's where Dionysius is getting it from. Now, she was a bright gal and had done enough church history to go, really? Oh, my. And I said, what's really important about that is that Maximus the Confessor doesn't emphasize God as word, nor God as a communicator. But doesn't the Bible say, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God? <coughs> Isn't, doesn't the Bible treasure? I just read Psalm 119 about God's words, his laws, his ways, his truths, clean, cleanse, change, capture us. God's words are the key because he's a communicating God. What is this doing denying that God is a communicating God at his core? And I say that's coming from a different source than God. And when you got down this his line, I think that maybe what Paul said about or Jesus said, you're your father, the devil. Whenever he speaks, he speaks the lie. I really think that's where this is coming from. I'll be that harsh on it. I don't buy it for a second. 
So, but it also spread to the West. People like Eugene, St. Victor, Rhineland Mystics, Teresa of Avila, St. John the Cross, Ignatius of Loyola, who started the Jesuits, the Quakers, Richard Foster, and even Dallas Willard started to move into this when he was working with this thing called Renovatio, the renovation of the soul by following the threefold ascent. So I'm getting feisty by, by naming names here, but just to say that this stuff is now a growing feature of even evangelical Christianity. And this is the history of it. Okay? So that's kind of the, the package that I want to offer to you. We just have a, just five minutes here before we're going to wrap up. So let me just walk through um, the uh, three gals that we started with. Remember, Our first gal uh, there in Slovenia, Polona, is um, getting married. And what's happening is when the priest lifts the chalice for, and then the cup, or the cup and then the chalice, what he's doing is he is calling on Christ to come down and by his grace to transform that into the body and blood of Christ. And the assumption there is that is the material grace, the grace is a what, not a who, that then is going to account for the space or the gap between the unreachable God and who we are as creatures. And our sin has created a greater spot space, and what we do is we're trying to build a bridge by collecting grace to get as far as we can to achieve salvation, which is to say to satisfy God's demands of righteousness. Okay, so that's why Mary, who is more gracious in that tradition than anyone else, is the one who tends to be pursued more boldly because she has grace to spare. She has innumerable bits of grace to share. And the saints are saints because they have more grace to spare than they needed for themselves to get into heaven and to reach full blessing. Do you catch that? Grace is a what, it's not a who. What's the difference between her and Sarah, who was there in England and Chippenham, who was deeply converted, the foul mouth, mouth nurse, the drill sergeant, director of this nursing group, who's now as soft as can be, the loveliest lady you could hope for in terms of her tender heart. What tradition did she represent? The change from the inside out tradition. We do not become just by doing just deeds, but having been made righteous, we do righteous things. She was changed because the love of God transformed her. And the transformation was so clear, so obvious. No one was telling her what to do. They just, we just introduced her to Christ, and she fell in love with Christ. And then Amy, whose email I got, whose update I got, is now a missionary, Protestant Christian missionary, uh, doing this unique ministry to young girls. And what changed her? I told her, Amy, I think what happened to you is when you were doing your studies, Christianity started to become very academic for you. And you begin not to sense God's love for you. And all the language about willpower and grace is a what, not a who. Enabling grace and equipping you to do God's will and that God's duty and calling is for you to obey him and all this stuff. Just cause you to say, I've had enough. I, when am I going to ever please God? In the meantime, over here where people are saying, oh, we're just having pure experience and when we go to church, we do these chants and we close our eyes and we hear, oh, and the, the, there's holy water and there's, oh, it's like we're getting closer and closer to God. And it's the version of Christianity that comes from Dionysius. And it's unfolded now as the Greek Orthodox liturgy, but it has no real interest in searching the scriptures. So I said, Amy, do you realize that what you're really looking for is the love of God? And that comes from the Trinity who pours his love out into our hearts. And you are getting starved for that over here in your academic work. But what you've done is you've gone over here, but love is not present there because the God behind that version 
of religion, spirituality is still a singularity. He's a one. And he's inviting you into something that is, you're told that there will be profound experience, but there's no guarantee of it. Because frankly, this God is not a lover. He's just pure bad, whatever that is. And you don't know what it is, nor can you talk about it, because the nature of this God is that he doesn't communicate. When in fact the Bible says God is a communicator. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So I said, Amy, I think what you're doing is you have retreated from this tradition properly, but I encourage you to go to the middle tradition where you're going to find the experience of God's love. Go talk to him about it, because the Spirit of God loves to hear prayers of, Are, is this for real? Do you really love me? I'm so hungry for that. And what did she do? She went there, and she came back. Yeah, wow. That changes everything. And she stepped out of the Greek Orthodox Church, and now she's a missionary. Having a real, the hand of God is really working in and through her, and she's now captured by the love of Christ. She was looking for experience, but looking for it in the wrong place. Okay. Does that make some sense? Now, am I here to prove all this stuff? No, I'm just here to tease you, just to say there's a lot more... The complex stuff, the heavy lifting you can do if you're interested, I can aim you at the stuff. But I think, frankly, most of you go, whoa, this is a little heavy. But at least I want to tease you and say it's out there. And you can start to look, and what you'll find is that the different traditions will start to show up once you're kind of alert to them. And you'll find as you probe them, I think you're going to find a real consistency in some of the things that we've described here. There's some overlap, or some fusion, confusion, whatever you want to call it. But at the core, these three did, uh, traditions are very distinct. And there, I hope that's useful to you. I think we're out of time. We said we would be finished by 8.30. Ken, maybe we could close with the word of prayer. Yeah. Um, just one note, and I'm Rhonda's blog on a regular basis. Actually, was working on one here this morning. But uh, what, what's the website for that? Uh, no surprise, spreadinggoodness.org. And www.spreadinggoodness.org. Yeah. Okay, so you can look that up as well. But let me, let's just stand and, and let's pray here. Father, you, uh, uh, you loved us. And, and even the reason that we are created because of was an overflow of your great love for your creation. And so, Father, we just want to stop and give you thanks. And, and Lord, as we have been challenged here for a few days, would you just uh, cause us to search the scriptures? Would, would you um, open our eyes as we read our Bibles? And might we see your passion and your love and your compassion that you have for us? So, so, Lord, would you reveal yourself to us through your word as we, uh, we dig, as we get to know you. So we thank you for your love, and uh, we just want to give this time to you. May it stir us, may it stir us to really to seek you with our heart and our soul and our mind. So we just pray for safety as well as we leave, and we just thank you again for your greatness and your love. We simply pray in your name. Amen. Ron will be here for just a couple of minutes. If you got one, if you get a question you want to come up and ask, go for it. But we'll be yeah.